Chapter 18 The Sweet Potatoes All count of days and weeks was lost, time just drifted on. When the tide was out was the time to fish. When the tide was in was sleeping time. If night, if day, there was nothing to do but sit up on the mound or peak and gaze out to sea. From the peak, Charlie's camp was plainly visible. He had built quite a good one from odds and ends of wreckage, apparently with the roof neatly thatched with grass. The mere burning <clears throat> of a tent meant only a spasm of anger to Charlie. His camp looked a great deal more inviting than a hole in the rocks. One day he emerged from the mangroves, threw his fish down by the galley fire, and moved about camp quite normally. I determined to visit him for company's sake and to ask for some wire for the spear. The job of constantly fashioning new points and hardening them was so tedious and the spears were so inefficient that each day brought a struggle to secure sufficient fish to live. Failures occurred so frequently the prongs would not always penetrate the scales and skin, which meant hesitation and attempting to spear a large fish. To hold anything over a five-pound fish was impossible, even when, luckily, the prongs pierced it. To spear a fish did not always mean to secure it, for the fish invariably put up a violent struggle and stood a good chance of wrenching away from an inefficient weapon. More than once, the very first throw of the day had been amiss, and the points had bur burred against roots or coral. I longed for iron prongs. So one morning I walked along the reef, then turned inland toward Charlie's camp, and saw him at the foot of the peak near the mangrove edge on the one tiny flat loamy spot on the island. He was bending among the long grass, apparently working. He was tending sweet potato plants, their vivid green in orderly rows, well hidden and hedged all around by the tall grass. They must be the plants he had sown, it seemed, months ago now. A famishing feeling came over me, without bread for a long time, living only on fish and crabs. The thought of those potatoes was almost overwhelming. He looked up, then bent again to his weeding. They look good, I nodded enthusiastically. Not bad, he growled. They're coming on well. I never dreamt you could make such a good garden out of this tiny place. A man can do a lot with unpromising matter material if he sets his mind to it. What surprises me is that I've sat up on that peak and never noticed the garden down here. A man seldom sees what's under his nose. You've worked a miracle anyway. I don't remember when I've ever seen sweet potatoes look so well. Charlie straightened up and with the pride of the true gardener gazed reflectively at the plants. They have come on well. They'll last for months now. With this garden, a man need not worry about being out of flower. I've got some pumpkin and melon seeds too. If a man only had a few goats, he could easily keep, him, keep himself in meat. And fowls would find plenty to live on in this island. There's insects among the grass and seeds. Fowls would soon get to rooting along the mangrove edges at high water. Plenty of shrimps and water grubs in the mud there, and they could tackle shellfish too, break them with their beaks against a stone like wild birds do. Plenty of eggs then, they'd lay like clockwork. We poked about among the plants, admiring them. Mine was a hungry admiration, though a genuine one. Charlie was pleased because he was born a gardener. He had planned this garden long ago. He planted it and quietly tended it and seen it come to fruition. He bent down and scraped the rich black loam from the roots of a plant, exposing the pink young tubers I tingled. They won't be ready for the pot for another ten days. When they are, you'd better come along and dig some. With pleasure, <clears throat> I accepted enthusiastically. That day cannot come too soon. Take them from wherever you see I've taken them, he directed. Then the rows will grow evenly, and plant the vines again where you take the tubers from. We'll have them continually growing then for months on end, as we dig one row, we'll have automatically planted another, and so on. 
Right on, I'll dig them properly. This garden is going to make a great difference. It is. Help make life livable and gives a man something to think of. How's your fishing? Not bad. I have to push farther out over the island though, as I have as I fish the smaller creeks out. I found the same thing. Lots of the fish seem to make their home in the one creek. As they get killed or hunted, out the creek becomes bare of fish except for strays brought in by the tide. Yes, I'm finding it dashed awkward now, though. A while back, a big fish got away with my wire prongs, and it's been a wretched job ever since trying to spear them with wooden prongs. There's plenty of wire hooks at the camp. Come and get some. Good-o. Those iron prongs were going to be more precious than gold. We strolled, yarning back to his camp, but what a shock a stranger would have got had he landed on the island and come face to face with Charlie. His tangled, wiry beard was black and gray, his mustache ragged and long, his thatch of iron-gray hair hung down over deep-set eyes, a grimly set mouth, the remains of a shirt and trousers exposed long hairy limbs burned black from sun and spray. Bareheaded with big bare feet, Charlie looked the wild man. I wondered how frightening I looked. We yarned at the camp until the incoming tide forced a return to the mound. It was a very cheerful return though, with a gloating backward glance toward the hidden potato patch, some strange feel freak of memory brought back Palestine, and snipers lying so close and still in the barley fields that a man might actually walk on one before he saw him. And on this tiny speck, on the one wee patch of loamy soil, long grass had shielded a bed of growing sweet potatoes. The sun went down and quietness came. That was a happy evening in the den with the fire burning brightly. Busy straightening four wire hooks into four prongs, he tap 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 on the stone anvil, a business like accompaniment to the job on hand. Then sharpening the points, tempering them, and binding them expertly to the spear shaft. The day of the immature was just about finished now. Tomorrow's fishing would be a pleasure. It would be a lucky fish that escaped, a pleasure too, and the thought that while Charlie was all right, we could enjoy a yarn every day. Time would fly now, what with a yarn and iron spear prongs and sweet potatoes to look forward to and it would be a good idea to go every day to the well and keep my water bucket and belly cans full to the brim with water. I had felt sorely tempted to suggest that we camp in company again, but second thoughts had counseled that we should get along better if we remained as we were. Charlie would inevitably succumb to another wild turn. That night, Dreams were wonderful, dreams a feast of boiled sweet potatoes. Next morning the tide was not right out when I dived into the mangroves. New spear in hand, the balance of the thing was company. The iron prongs gave entire confidence. And this was going to be an exploring day, for the fish in the nearby creeks were rapidly thinning out. Pools that had been alive with fish now sheltered only one or two hunted specimens here and there. The big crabs at the colony were not so plentiful either, and there seemed to be only one colony. It would be disastrous if they were killed out, or if the cunning brutes migrated. Numerous fish apparently lived in mangroves and seldom ventured out to sea. Preferring the easy life when the tide was out, the security of the mangrove roots when the tide came swirling in with voracious hunters from the open sea. Life for them out there would mean ceaseless warfare. With time and experience and keenness, it had become natural to distinguish these fish. There was the flat butterfish that always lent its molted body against the mottled roots of a particular tree. The big browny black cod that had its den within the big twisted browny black roots of a dark barked mangrove. There was the individual fish with a piece bitten out of the tail. That was always to be seen in its own particular pool. 
the fish with some particular marking distinguishing it, and the fish whose snout was to be seen poking out from below some particular submerged log. Practically every pool held its big cod that, because of its size, could safely stay in the open upon the cleanest patch of sand. The beastly eels clung to their particular burrows, but these were all individual burrows, quite unlike the crab colony. The burrow of an eel was to be found strategically placed among the roots in the edge of a pool. An occasional big crab, explorer, or outcast prowled about in the depths of the mangroves. His dull green or shadowy purple or heavy blue shell merging so well with the mud and roots that unless he foolishly moved, it was only by chance you saw him. These pugnacious martyrs were bush rangers among their kind, though when cornered they invariably put up a fight against man or monster fish. Easy to tell too the outside fish that had come in with the tide and remained too long. Such a fish would frantically swim downstream only to be turned back by a sandbank and whiz past me back up the pool. There it would turn and torpedo down again in a futile effort to reach the main creek and the open sea. Regular denizens, knowing that such escape was impossible, would simply dive into the tangle of roots lining the pool and pressing themselves against a root lie still and camouflage. So well aware were they of the protection of mobility that some would allow a spear to be thrust twice at them without moving. But experience teaches, given an iron prong spear, I now seldom missed except when throwing at a cruising fish. To throw just ahead of those swiftly moving ripples and hit the unseen mark is very different to spearing stationary prey, even when marvelously camouflaged and protected by a network of roots. An entirely different throw and aim was necessary too. Instead of aiming just behind, a man had to aim just ahead of the fish. That is ahead of the faint ripples that were made on the surface by his speeding snout below. When the tide was in, the big ocean forest swarmed with fish of every type, determined ravenous brutes no matter what their size. Savage fights that took place then throughout the submerged forest, often to be plainly heard up on the mound. But the mangrove fish must have been comparatively safe under the maze of mangrove roots, while incoming fish sought and fought for them in such a natural environment. But against such obstacles, many a fish with battered snout must gladly have made his way back to sea. I went easily on into the still, silent heart of the mangroves. Rotted logs and stumps lay in the mud, bored through and through with the tunnels of the ship worm. Funny little hoppy fish with big, comical eyes for all the world like mischievous gollywogs, climbed the mangrove roots or went skipping over the mud. These quaint things can breathe in the air as well as in water. Now and again, a long mangrove pod dropped down into the mud, its baby root landing first. The tiny, the tide would carry it away to be washed onto some lonely island, there to grow into a mangrove tree. Fiddler crabs backed away making a fighting bluff with one big red claw raised menacingly above a little one. Quaggy pools were underfoot. Sometimes a patch of pale blue mud had to be warily approached. This was quick mud, slimy, sticky stuff, possessed of some horrible sucking power that could drag a man down. To follow up the muddy creeks where possible was the best way otherwise to step crouching over the twisted roots which so often covered acres. Imperceptibly, the gloom lightened, faint daylight appeared among the trunks ahead. In surprise, I stepped into easily the largest creek I'd yet seen, lined by far the tallest trees. One of these high up was a rough platform of big sticks, and standing on it were two white-breasted sea eagles. Masters of all they surveyed, they glared contemptuously down. It was a pleasure to look at them. They were something new and interesting, something that shared the island with Charlie and me and the birds and fish and crabs in the sea. Up above was the open sky, the, this wide creek, 
was a succession of long, shallow pools, both mud and sand lined, with here and there a solemn crane at the water's edge and with others perched on the trees. A shadow glided just under water, an enormous stingray with small pig like eyes, its broad wings gently undulating, its whip like tail slowly waving, the bony sting fully six inches long, a terrible thing to come lashing a man's leg. Let a man step on that fat, slimy body half buried in the sand, and the whip like tail would lash up and, and around him, and the poison sting pierced like a knife. These pools, because they were long and wide and thus free of roots except at the edges, were the home of stingrays. Of all colors and sizes, tiny smoke clouds were drifting up through the water where the brutes were slowly nosing the sand, burrowing for shellfish, while others slowly glided by. Here and there on the pool bottoms, they lay almost buried, their snouts and wings lightly covered with sand, just portions of their whip tails visible. These would be treacherous pools to fish in, probably this big creek twisted right across the heart of the island. Possibly its outlet was the big creek mouth where Charlie and I had chased the turtle. Overhead here, as if coming down from the clear sky, was a murmur in the air of the sea, pounding the distant reef in the slime lay decaying logs like huge crocodiles, dreaming in mud of some bygone age. From the mangrove edge I searched as far as visibility allowed, every log list here might be the home of some real crocodile. Time was speeding by, it would be pretty awful to be caught in a place like this by the tide. Cautiously I crossed the creek, prodding the spear into the sand and mud ahead, watched by the eagles and cranes. Now and again a stingray glided away, and it was temptation to hurl the spear into the broad flat back but such a target would have departed with the swirl and carried the precious iron prongs with it. Into the mangroves on the opposite side in silence, a dense forest here, the visibility only a few yards. Here the roots grew much taller. The creeks were steeper and much fewer, but there appeared to be fish in all, fish that stared up without moving that never before had been disturbed a man. It must be a long way back into the sea. This walk proved there were unlimited fish on the island. One could never starve, even though one fished out creek after creek. The mangroves were almost impenetrable, necessitating continuous crouching over the roots. An eerie feeling crept over me that there, in the gloom among that jungle of roots, nothing to see but a twisted maze of grotesque shapes, nothing to smell but mud, nothing to hear but a silence that became intense with listening. But there was seething, creeping, crawling life. Everywhere, hidden mangrove birds were staring from behind, leaf and trunk. There were insects in the mangrove's leaves and boring things in the trunks. With intense concentration, a man could distinguish tiny flakes like grains of falling powder. This finest sawdust was kicked out by the legs or tail of something boring into a mangrove branch. Put your ear to the branch and you would hear the tiny thuds or the tiny sawing as the insect within bored deeper. By mischance, you might easily get the grains of sawdust kicked in your eye. I wondered at the power that had made all the life that was teeming.